firstly, it's created, um, he's created an incredibly lively, enjoyable read. Um, now, I do think that the subjects of the book are intrinsically interesting people with their affairs and eccentricities and family rebellions and brilliant ideas. Um, but Lipscomb shows real literary talent in the way that he weaves together the four women's lives in a really exciting narrative. Um, a talent that you might not necessarily expect for somebody trained in an analytic philosophy. Second, um, it's really amazing the way that Lipscomb's managed to weave philosophical ideas into the narrative in a way that's very accessible, um, something particularly impressive, given that some of the thinkers he's discussing are notoriously obscure, such as Wittgenstein. There's uh, several themes in the book. It'd be really tempting to stop and reflect on, but I'm just going to mention one before passing on over to Professor Lipscomb. And that is um, that throughout the book, um, Lipscomb highlights what an extraordinary achievement it was for these women to become as successful as they did in such a male dominated environment. Now, a lot has changed since then and things have got significantly better. However, academic philosophy remains male dominated. Um, and in the UK, for example, women only make up about one quarter of philosophy professors. So we might take the opportunity to reflect as we read the book on what factors made it possible for these talented women to become so successful and whether there are any lessons to be learned for today. Just to give a couple of examples from the book, uh, at one point, Lipscomb explains how a prerequisite to get onto greats, the degree at Oxford that um, some of the subjects of the book took. Um, an admission requirement for that is to be competent at Greek and Latin, which looks like a sensible requirement for a classics course, um, but was not a, a, something that was available at girls' schools, or at least not up to the level that was required for entry to Oxford. Um, Lipscomb comments in relation that there's a lesson here in how gatekeeping works. Um, and it, the effect of an admission criteria like this is to cut off opportunities for people who might be capable of really brilliant work. The second example, throughout the book, uh, Professor Lipscomb talks about the close relationships that the women have with senior figures in the field um, and comments that it's these close mentoring relationships that enable these women to imagine themselves as having a life in philosophy. So those sorts of um, uh, comments and, and stories give us a chance to reflect on uh, what lessons we might take forward uh, from these stories to help make philosophy an inclusive discipline where really talented people uh, from various backgrounds are able to succeed. Um, I'm going to pass over to Professor Lipscomb in a moment, um, who I think, um, I'm not sure what, how the late start is going to affect timings. I don't know if Gillian wants to come in on that. But I think the plan was for Professor Lipscomb to speak for 30 to 40 minutes, and then there'll be a chance for people to ask questions. Um, please give us the questions in the Q&A, and then I will um, read those out to Professor Lipscomb. Um, and as a warning, they, they won't necessarily be read out in the order in which they're, um, in which they're asked. So um, congratulations to Professor Lipscomb on the excellent book. Um, and over to him. Thanks so much, Christina, for the warm words and uh, to Jillian and Debbie for organizing this. It's an honor uh, to receive this invitation and uh, to be able to address you this evening. In October of 1939, the streets of Oxford were unusually quiet. It was the start of term and ordinarily, thousands of students would have been crowding the tea shops and the bookshops and the theaters and the lecture halls of the city. But that September, nearly all of Britain's men between 18 and 41 had been conscripted into the military. And they joined those who had volunteered the spring before. The men were mostly gone. But the women stayed. In her mid 80s, Mary Midgley mused that she might never have become a philosopher if not for those extraordinary circumstances in wartime Oxford. 
The effect, she wrote, quote, was to make it a great deal easier for a woman to be heard in discussion than it is in normal times. Sheer loudness of voice has a lot to do with the difficulty, but there is also a temperamental difference about confidence, about the amount of work that one thinks is needed to make one's opinion worth hearing." End quote. What's undeniable is the shift. Before the 40s, only a few women in the English-speaking world had ever made careers in philosophy. In 1939, just two of Oxford's women's societies even had a philosophy tutor. But the war years produced four of the most original writers on ethics of the second half of the 20th century, Mary Midgley, Elizabeth Anscombe, Philippa Foote, and Iris Murdoch. Two things I was encouraged to do uh, this evening, uh, and a uh, difficult decision. What do I do with a half an hour and so much that could be said? Uh, there's not time for everything. So I'm going to focus particularly on the Oxford years, on the undergraduate years, uh, which Christina has already pointed us toward in her opening remarks. I'm going to talk about the formation of these women at Oxford as undergraduates. And second, uh, with Debbie's encouragement, I'm making this in significant part of reading uh, from my chapter on Oxford in wartime. I have sanded and shaved this until I think I can present it in uh, under 30 minutes, leaving ample time still for questions, which I would welcome to go in any direction relevant to the book. As I begin, I do want to highlight two consequences of my focusing on this part of the narrative. First, I won't get into the mature ideas of these philosophers, because those ideas were years in the future at the time that I'm narrating. Second, uh, Elizabeth Anscombe doesn't really come into this chapter. Uh, she figures centrally in the chapter after, but not this one. Again, those interested in hearing me comment either on later developments or on Anscombe in particular, ask and you shall receive. One final note, in this chapter, I refer to Philippa Foote and Mary Midgley by their unmarried names, Philippa Bosenkat, Mary Scrutton, just so that no one is perplexed. <laughs> Philippa Bosenkat only really met Iris Murdoch as they were each preparing for their finals in June 1942. Their shared tutor, Donald McKinnon, suggested to Murdoch that, quote, Philippa might appreciate a friendly visit. End quote. Housebound and discouraged, however good a front she was showing, Bosenkett did need company. Still, it wasn't the introduction she would have chosen. Ever self-conscious about whether she truly belonged at Oxford, and intimidated by the more glamorous Murdoch, Bosenkett would not have chosen for their first real conversation to happen with her torso encased in plaster. Bosenkett had been a frail child, contracting abdominal TB around age eight. The prescription she got was a year sleeping in the open air. So, summer and winter that year, she slept on a balcony outside the nursery window. This was in northernmost North Yorkshire. Icy winds swept in from the nearby coast through the winter months. Whether or not this had any real effect on Bosenkett's TB, it certainly toughened her. But that hard-earned toughness didn't stop her being nervous about her place at Somerville College, or from fretting about the quality of her work. And now her back was acting up at the worst possible moment. Was it a recurrence of TB? Given Bosenkett's history, her doctors were taking no chances, and ordered her to spend the summer in a cast. Her tutors had agreed to the extraordinary measure of teaching her in her lodgings, and the principal of Somerville had arranged for her exams to be administered there too. But she was seeing almost no one. She couldn't go to lectures. She couldn't visit the Bodleian. She couldn't even go to university parks a block away to take her mind off her endless revisions. McKinnon often nudged people to support one another. Murdoch wouldn't otherwise have looked in on Bosenkett. Their most significant interaction until then had been when Bosenkett opposed Murdoch's candidacy for the presidency of the junior common room the year before. Murdoch didn't take this hard. But still, they scarcely knew each other. It wouldn't have made sense for her to pay Bosenkett a visit. Murdoch revered McKinnon, though, so she went. It took her longer to gather a bouquet of wildflowers than to walk from her digs in Parktown to the door of Number 2 Bradmore Road. She knocked, went up to Bosenkett's room, and sat down beside her, 
so began a friendship that would last the rest of their lives. In the late 30s, Oxford's women colleges, or societies, may have been the most selective undergraduate institutions in the world. A number of factors conspired toward this result. The prestige long associated with an Oxbridge education was compounded at Oxford because they now granted degrees to women, while Cambridge still did not. It made Oxford a particularly attractive destination for women, at least ones that were ambitious for a degree. Not that Oxford's policy was uncontroversial. In 1927, fretting that the university was acquiring a reputation as, quote, socialistic, weak in athletics, and bewomaned, end quote. The ancient house of congregation capped the number of women undergraduates at 840 out of a total population of over 4,000. A quota remained in force until the late 1950s. So an English schoolgirl in the 30s, seeking an elite degree, was competing with candidates from across the empire for one of about 250 places a year. If it was difficult to gain admission to any of Oxford's women's societies, it was particularly difficult to get into Somerville. Somerville and Lady Margaret Hall were Oxford's first women's colleges, opening together in 1879. From the first, Somerville had both the more scholarly and the more radical reputation. Each of Oxford's women's societies was founded by educational reformers, radicals in their way. Nevertheless, differences in charter led over time to differences in reputation and atmosphere. Lady Margaret Hall was officially Anglican and built a reputation as a socially respectable destination for bright young women, making the idea of an Oxford education less threatening to some prospective students and their families. Somerville, by contrast, was pointedly non-sectarian. There was a minor furor in the early 30s when an old Somervillian gave a big donation for a chapel. What would a Somerville chapel be like? And Somerville was as proudly bluestock as proudly blue stocking as any place on earth. Being non-sectarian, it also drew a wider pool of applicants, making the competition for places fiercer and reinforcing a culture of academic striving. As a popular verse of the 30s had it, quote, Lady Margaret Hall for ladies, St. Hugh's for girls, St. Hilda's for wenches, Somerville for women. This was certainly unfair to St. Hugh's and St. Hilda's. With the elite women of the empire concentrated into a few colleges and one established as the class of the group, it was no surprise that Somerville students performed exceptionally. By 1945, the principals of all four women's colleges were old Somervillians. Somerville's application process was certainly the most daunting. Anyway, Mary Scrutton was daunted. Women on both sides of her family had been attending university for a generation, and she was expected to go. Sitting her examinations in December 1937, it seemed to Scrutton as if her whole life was riding on the results. She took the exams in, quote, a state of panic. Every applicant for admission to Oxford had to sit for two sets of written exams. The university-wide examinations required candidates to show basic competence in two or three languages, one of them Latin or Greek, and either maths or natural science. But there were also college-specific examinations, because every undergraduate at Oxford has to be affiliated with one of its dozens of federated colleges. The college-specific exams consisted mainly of a set of papers linked to each applicant's intended field of study. But there's also the general paper, which removed applicants from their strongholds of special preparation and exposed their capacity, or incapacity, to think on their feet. The prompts for the general paper rewarded a philosophic temperament, an interest in stepping back and looking hard at some concept or piece of conventional wisdom, or in coming at some familiar fact from an unusual direction. To her good fortune, Scruton had a history teacher at Downhouse School who knew what the paper was like and prepared her students with prompts like, quote, nature is too green and badly lighted. Discuss. All this was intimidating enough. Somerville added a layer. The college examinations were administered off-site. Afterward, candidates who had impressed their examiners were invited to Oxford for an interview, a chance for college staff to assess temperament and fit. The atmosphere conjures itself, the nerves, the posturing, the emotional extremes. As Scruton waited for her interview, she sank into despondency, listening to, quote, 
a smart girl who kept telling us all how much she'd impressed the interview panel by explaining to them just what made Keats choose the words blushful hippocrine in Ode to a Nightingale. I wished he hadn't chose them, she thought, and expected nothing but disaster. But she would be surprised. The Somerville staff had a good idea what kind of student they wanted. Impressed with Scruton's general paper, they admitted her to study classics and offered her a scholarship. For all Somerville's selectivity, its students did suffer deficits relative to their male peers. And Christina touched on this in her opening remarks. The most distinguished and best resourced public schools in Britain, Eton, Rugby, Winchester, were male only. These schools were particularly strong, and schools open to women comparatively weaker in classical languages, a prerequisite for admission to the university and the foundation of the famous classics course for which Scruton had applied. This was no accident. These schools' curricula were built precisely to propel students toward Oxford, and indeed, though this might seem surprising nowadays, toward classics. Greats was, by 1938, a standard pathway to academic careers in multiple fields, philosophy, ancient history, archaeology. More importantly, it was a portal into the male-dominated fields of politics and civil service. Pupils at elite boys' schools received years of preparation translating into and out of classical Greek and Latin. The greats picked up where their school syllabi left off. Few women received comparable preparation. When Scruton started at Down House, Greek wasn't even available. A particularly good classics teacher, seeing how well Scruton and a few others were progressing in Latin, offered to teach them Greek. It thus became possible, just, just barely, for Scruton to aspire to read greats, a course which otherwise would have been closed to her, as it would have been closed to most of her teachers. And there is almost a parable here about the ways in which gatekeeping works. Gatekeepers could suppose they're simply insisting on baseline competence in relevant subjects. Isn't it obvious, as Christina said, to make Greek and Latin prerequisites for a classics course? But given the way the world is, given what's on offer at the girls' schools and the boys' schools, the effect of insisting on this background is to cut off opportunities for people who might be capable of impressive work. However temperamentally fretful she was, Scruton was always willing to work. Somerville had admitted her on the condition that she get remedial coaching in ancient languages before coming up in autumn. Scruton had already started this the preceding summer, preparing simply for her exams. So she and an imperious old Somervillian carried on through the rest of 1937 and the first half of 38. Her tutor's reaction when Scruton received her scholarship offer Quote, well, I'd rather lose my reputation as a prophet than my reputation as a coach. Scruton might easily have passed Iris Murdoch on the pavement in front of her tutor's house in Chiswick. Murdoch lived nearby and was getting tutoring in classical languages herself. It's possible that they were seeing the same tutor. In late September 1938, the girls likely rode the Great Western Railway west and north from Paddington to Oxford and making their way laboriously over the tracks and across the canal, lugged their things up Walton or St. Giles streets. Merton, Mur Murdoch and Scruton settled in at opposite ends of the college. Scruton in a dark room with small windows on the top story of the late Victorian West Building. Murdoch in an airy new room over the gates. The only two Somervillians in their year, this is telling, who were reading greats, they were immediately brought together in tutorials. And so they finally met, Scruton plopping down on the floor of Murdoch's room day after day as they began trying to turn themselves into classicists. They too would be friends for life. Shortly after Murdoch and Scruton's arrival, Somerville Dean Vera Farnell sat the first years down and lectured them. Quote, you must seriously realize that you have to be careful how you behave. It isn't a joking matter. The women are still very much on probation in this university. You may think that it doesn't matter if you do something a little wild, but I can tell you that it will." End quote. Farnell's admonition didn't stop some Somervillians from slipping over the college walls at night, but hers was a voice of hard experience. The prejudices and anxieties that had prompted the university to cap the number of women undergraduates were not dead. The sense of precariousness 
that women's position as members of the university was unsettled subsided after the war, but in 38 it was still deeply felt. In the short term, the women couldn't win. If they behaved impeccably and overcame all deficits to outclass their male peers, they provoked airy contempt. Christopher Hobhouse's chatty 1939 guidebook, Oxford, gives a sense of the prevailing stereotypes. Quote, though their numbers are small, a casual visitor to Oxford might well gain the impression that women form an actual majority. They are perpetually a wheel. They bicycle in droves from lecture to lecture, capped and gowned, handlebars laden with notebooks and notebooks crammed with notes. Relatively few men go to lectures, the usefulness was of which was superseded some while ago by the invention of the printing press. The women, docile and literal, continue to flock to every lecture with medieval zeal and record in an hour of longhand what could easily have been assimilated in ten minutes in an armchair." End quote. Hobhouse grudgingly acknowledges the fruits of the women's, quote, stupefying assiduity, end quote, even as he tries to represent this as a fault. Quote, the results of this obsession are clearly seen in the examination class lists, end quote. Heedless of the Farnells and the Hobhouses, as diligent as she was ecstatic, Murdoch particularly threw herself into every aspect of university life. She dragged Scruton with her into much of it. A, quote, hurricane of essays and proses and campaigns and committees and sherry parties and political and aesthetic arguments, end quote. In particular, both Murdoch and Scruton promptly got involved in local politics. That fall, with Chamberlain's strategy of appeasing Hitler at the forefront of national conversation, they canvassed for A.D. Lindsay, master of Balliol College, who was running against conservative Quentin Hogg. Living with a sense of threat and decay that typified the interwar years, they longed, as much as any generation before or since, to give themselves to a redemptive cause. Not having been old enough to do anything about the horrors of the Spanish Civil War, students threw themselves into the Lindsay campaign as if it were a crusade. The students were shocked when the Oxford electorate narrowly elected Hogg. They represented the defeat in Manichaean terms. Quote, the creative, the generous, the imaginative, end quote, versus people dominated by selfishness, stodginess, and insincerity, end quote. Somehow, Murdoch was able to give herself no less fully to her studies than to politics, though her and Scruton's tutorials with classicist Mildred Hartley arguably confirmed one of Hobhouse's criticisms, that women dons applied extreme pressure to their pupils to equal or outdo their male counterparts determined that her students would match their male peers stride for stride, no matter their starting point, Hartley insisted that Murdoch and Scruton do Greek and Latin translations and even compositions in prose and verse, a typical feature of boys' school curricula. These verse compositions taught the young women nothing. Scruton later likened them to, quote, a rather desperate kind of crossword puzzle, end quote. Happily, there were other aspects of scholarly life that were more rewarding. Murdoch sketched ancient Greek vases in the basement of the Ashmolean Museum, and both she and Scruton attended lectures from E.R. Dodds on Greek tragedy and on Plato. At Hartley's instigation, both Murdoch and Scruton participated for a time in German-Jewish emigre Edward Frankel's legendary years-long seminar on Aeschylus's Agamemnon. This play, indeed the entire Oresteia, is a profound meditation on evil, suffering, and retribution. From the first great chorus with its hymn to Zeus, Scruton remembered the seminar returning again and again to these words, quote, Zeus has led us on to know. The helmsman lays it down as law that we must suffer, suffer into truth, end quote. Perhaps no one could read a work like this with a great scholar and not be affected, but Scruton recalled a moment in which she and Murdoch brought something to the tragedy that their Eton and rugby-educated peers did not, maybe precisely because they'd been less cloistered. They were talking with a fellow student about a passage that one of them had been assigned to introduce. Scruton was struck by, quote, how much better equipped than us he seemed to be about the language, and how much less idea he had of the point of what was being said, end quote. In the time that an elite public school might have given to Greek, she and Murdoch had delved instead into history and literature and politics. 
Murdoch wrote perhaps her best poem about the experience of the seminar. They sat in that ancient-looking room in Corpus at sunset, week after week, everyone half knowing what lay ahead, that like Iphigenia and Cassandra, Achilles and Agamemnon, their lives might be cut short. Quote, did we expect the war? What did we fear? First love's incinerating, crippling flame? Or that it would appear in public that we could not name the aorist of some familiar verb? End quote. The philosophical climate of the 1930s was turbulent, but not in a way that was likely to inspire anyone who wasn't already a philosopher. The most influential figure was a brash, attention-seeking young lecturer, A.J. Ayer. In 1936, Ayer published an improbable book, a philosophical bestseller, Language, Truth, and Logic. The opening sentence lays down the challenge, quote, the traditional disputes of philosophers are, for the most part, as unwarranted as they are unfruitful." End quote. The reason, Ayer says, is that philosophers have not policed their language to make sure that their statements are even meaningful. And what kinds of statements are meaningful, according to Ayer? Just two. One, statements about the world that could be confirmed or disconfirmed by observation. And two, statements about the logic of our language. There are statements of fact, open to verification or falsification by experience. There are statements defining words or rules for making statements of fact. All else is sophistry and illusion. Ayer acknowledges nothing as a statement of fact, even if it seems to be one, if the speaker does not know, quote, what observations would lead him to accept the proposition as being true or reject it as being false, end quote. So consider someone who says that some action is wrong. Ayer asks, is he reporting an observation? Or are there observations he can imagine making that would lead him to retract his statement? Neither, Ayer thinks. Moral judgments simply praise or blame. They neither report nor predict anything. Ayer concludes, quote, if I now say, stealing money is wrong, I produce a sentence which has no factual meaning that is, expresses no proposition, which can be either true or false. It is as if I had written, stealing money, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, where the shape and thickness of the exclamation marks show, by a suitable convention, that a special sort of moral disapproval is being expressed." End quote. Ayer's tone of breezy dismissal was all too easy for undergraduates to accept and to adopt. More importantly, Ayer's view, with its restrictive conception of a fact, helped harden a dichotomy that had been emerging since the early modern period between fact and value. According to this dichotomy, this world picture, values are human projections onto a purposeless or value-free reality. Ayer embraced this picture, drew out its implications, and gave it swaggering expression. It didn't matter how many details of his views were later rejected. Ayer, more than anyone, established the terms in which young philosophers in the late 30s and early 40s would have to approach their discipline. He rendered suspect virtually all pre-modern moral philosophy, which did not sunder fact and value. For an extended period before and after the war, then, philosophers developed their theories in response to Ayer. In a letter to Bosenkett immediately after their graduation, Murdoch wrote that she was looking ahead contemplating the significance and direction of her life, but added glibly that, of course, such expressions were, quote, strictly meaningless, end quote. Air was in the air. As Murdoch's letter illustrates, the effect of Ayer's work was essentially destructive. It didn't help people think about their most urgent questions, like what to do with their lives. It undercut such thinking. As Murdoch would later recognize, Ayer's work did imply judgments, about better and worse. It glamorized a self-congratulatory toughness in facing a world where words like good and right have no meaning. But it was incompatible with the political idealism of Murdoch and her peers, with the judgments they were making every day about right and wrong, just and unjust. Ayer's philosophy offered little to this idealistic rising generation. Though Scruton, Murdoch, and Bosenkett each had a philosophic temperament, all three won scholarships with distinguished general papers, 
idealistic young people like them were unlikely to find Ayer's help philosophy helpful. They found it unsettling, even dumbfounding, but not constructive. If philosophy meant what Ayer did, what could it say about Franco and Hitler? Philosophy was salvaged for the Somervillians when, Somerville having no philosophy tutor of its own on staff, they were assigned for tutorials to young theologian philosopher Donald McKinnon. And this is the second point that Christina drew out. McKinnon's more famous now in theological circles, but he was a philosopher before he was a theologian. A Winchester pupil, he did so well in greats at New College that he was quickly brought back, still in his 20s, to be a fellow at Keeble. The hulking Scotsman was promptly invited to join a group that called itself the Brethren, a small coterie of rising philosophers that included Ayer. McKinnon was deeply interested in the whole history of philosophy. He taught his students to engage seriously with figures Ayer would consign to irrelevance. But as evidenced by the impression he made on the Brethren, McKinnon also kept up with contemporary philosophy. He took seriously Ayer's charge that his own inquiries in ethics and theology were meaningless. McKinnon wanted to reinvigorate theological reflection, particularly in the face of Ayer's challenge, because he found such reflection necessary to addressing the ethical and political issues of the moment. McKinnon was fixated on human evil and our responsibilities in the face of it. Like Dostoevsky's Ivan Karamazov, indeed, like Dostoevsky himself, as Ivan is a bit of a self-portrait in this way, McKinnon drew examples from the newspapers of the terrible things that people did to one another. He believed that any adequate theology or philosophy must be capable of speaking to these cases. When McKinnon is not remembered for these things, his brilliance, his preoccupation with the special challenges of his late modern moment, he's remembered as a tormented eccentric. The stories that circulate about him sucking on razor blades, chewing up pencils or lumps of coal, rolling himself up in the rug, probably reflect the stresses that he was under during the war. They date mostly from the Keeble years. Scrutton reminisced about him, quote, McKinnon often made strange, unpredictable movements and particular strange grimaces, which seemed to express profound anguish. A lot of the stories about him are true enough. He did wave pokers and other things about in an alarming way. He did lie on the floor or beat the wall violently. He was prone to long silences, sometimes not seeming to hear what was said to him. If McKinnon suffered from a condition like Tourette's, it may have been exacerbated in those days when, disqualified from military service by asthma, he threw himself into teaching as if to justify his existence, taking as many pupils as would ordinarily be divided among three or more fellows. Like Uriah in the biblical book of Samuel, he refused to sleep at home with his wife while other men were stationed across the channel and overseas. He slept in his rooms at Keeble when he wasn't on duty as a fire lookout. Years later, recalling his tutorials, Scrutton found McKinnon's generosity unfathomable. One day, having spoken with her already for two hours about Kant, the standard was one, McKinnon said, I don't think we've really gotten to the bottom of this. Come back on Thursday. As Bosenkett would later remark, he had no sense of proportion. And I have to pause here and just uh, reflect, again, in light of the theme that Christina sounded early. It's hard to imagine McKinnon with his eccentricities, uh, with his underlying condition, if that's what they were stemming from, also having opportunities to do what he did in the Contemporary Academy. That would be harder, too. So his is another case that might be fruitfully set side by side with these women's. McKinnon did not offer his students a philosophical program like Ayer's. Insofar as McKinnon had a program, it was to attend to perennial human questions and to the philosophers who addressed them. He did not ignore Ayer's critique, but neither did he cease asking questions that he found meaningful, even if Ayer would have called them pseudo-questions. He went on teaching philosophy as something integrally connected to life, when this conception had been nearly abandoned by his peers. And this rubbed off on his pupils, this example. His pupils would go on to challenge and then undo the orthodoxy of Ayer's world picture. Early in the war, we see it starting. Murdoch writes to a friend, Frank Thompson, quote, I had almost given up thinking of people and actions in terms of value. 
meeting McKinnon has made it a significant way of thinking again, end quote. Still, Murdoch's, Scruton's, and Bosenkett's studies inevitably came to feel unreal as the war and their university years ground on. Murdoch especially longed for more direct engagement with the world, but philosophy at least was not pointless. And thanks to McKinnon's instruction and example, all three came away with first-class marks in their finals, even Bosenkett encased in plaster. I think I'll stop there uh, to give us ample time, and uh, we can take this conversation in any of a host of directions. I might sit. <laughs> so if you do have any questions, please can you put them in the Q&A? Um, or you can, if that's easier, put them in the chat. I might take the opportunity whilst we're waiting for some questions to come through to, to uh, ask a question of, of my own. Um, so I was just wondering if um, you could say something about the picture of the world um, and of ethics that these women replaced Ayer's picture with. So you you, um, you you mentioned that that was a kind of dominant picture at the time. Are you able to, to say something about the picture that they eventually replaced it with? Sure. Um, what Ayer's picture, and he's, by, he's far from innovating here, he just gave a particularly powerful expression. What Ayer was drawing on was a history through much of the modern period uh, of separating facts from values, of thinking of the world as inert stuff, fully described in the language of physics with no remainder, um, which leaves judgments of good and bad, right and wrong, hard to locate. If physics, the world of facts, is everything real, what's left over besides that? What that picture replaced, though, was an older pre-modern picture, which certainly didn't work very well as physics when compared to the new modern physics. Um, there's no question that for the purposes of astronomy, uh, Aristotle's models needed to go in uh, favor of pictures that simplify to pictures of billiard balls bouncing off one another on a billiards table. But the older picture, uh, is one in which we think of ourselves and other creatures as having needs and possibilities with reference to which uh, we describe good and bad. Uh, and here's an example I always use with my students to stay away from human beings and the controversy of that right away. Suppose you are keeper of a game preserve and you're going to be trying to restock that game preserve with zebras or wolves. You're going to go get an expert on zebras or wolves, and you're going to say to this expert, look, I want good ones. Um, and what do you mean by good ones? Well, ones that are equipped for and gravitate toward a really robust life of the kind that uh, belongs to their species. And over the ensuing decades, we see Elizabeth Anscombe, Philippa Foote, Mary Midgley, those three especially, though encouraged and assisted by Murdoch, working out some version of this and trying to connect it to present day science so that it's not just a kind of antiquarian interest. Thank you. So we have got a few more questions now. So um, Nat Dyer asks, how well do you think contemporary English language philosophy deals with the perennial human questions that these women dealt with, or is it stuck in an abstract model world? That's a really good question. Um, I want not to throw under the bus. I don't know if that's a British expression or only an American one. Um, people who taught me and uh, people whose works I've found deeply instructive I do think that in the late modern research university, um, with its productivity uh, quotas, uh, 
that there is a tendency toward, um, I guess I'll call it scholasticism, uh, because it's very like the situation in the late medieval universities where commentaries upon commentaries upon commentaries proliferated, but not the kind of visionary system building uh, that, uh, say, Thomas Aquinas had done earlier in uh, the Middle Ages. Um, there was a kind of a closing in, commenting on other commentators, as I say. And I think there's a lot of pressure within the academy presently to produce that kind of work. Mary Midgley, who was a wonderful public intellectual, as well as, as, well as a very imaginative ethicist, uh, she's got many great one-liners, but one of them is she describes a lot of journal articles as, or a lot of journals, excuse me, as reputable cold, sore, rep reputable cold stores for eggs that everybody knows are never going to be eaten. Um, and that's sad. Uh, I think a lot of the people who are engaged with philosophy are, do, are people with brilliant ideas uh, to offer, but what gains prestige within the field, um, or at least what gets initial stability for one within the field, doesn't necessarily align with that. But let me take that back just the tiniest bit um, and say that maybe a long apprenticeship of doing less ambitious work can be helpful for saying uh, grander uh, and more visionary things. I think about Mary Midgley herself, who publishes the first of her 16 books at 59, and remarked, I think, to an interviewer, and a jolly good thing I did because I didn't know what I thought until then. Um, I think one possible lesson, I don't know how it would work with academic credentialing and promotion at all, but one possible implication of the stories of these women is Wait a while to say what you think. Sounds, sounds like some, some good advice. Um, Sue Mendes, um, who incidentally I believe was friendly with uh, Mary Midgley, um, has asked the following question. Will you please say something about the influence uh, or importance of R.M. Hare's moral philosophy mm -hmm. and its relationship to the ethical views of the quartet? Me too. Hare is the improver uh, who comes along and does better uh, and in much more impressive detail what Ayer had done in a kind of tossing off half a chapter uh, in Language, Truth, and Logic. There's a chapter on ethics and theology in Language, Truth, and Logic, and these topics are brought up in order to dismiss them. Um, but there were certain evident problems with Ayer's view, that on its face, it seemed really implausible. When we talk with other people about hard decisions we're facing, when we're close enough with someone to think critically with them about various courses of action, when we write into the papers to recommend some policy or action or other, um, these conversations never sound like you would think they would sound reading Ayer. Ayer more or less, this was uh, the way people put it as soon as they read his book, more or less reduces um, ethical arguments or the presentation of ethical views to cheering and heckling at sporting events, saying boo or hurrah, because you're just, he says, expressing your attitude as if by some special convention. And it's really hard to understand the ways in which we reason back and forth with one another if that's all there is. So Richard Hare, uh, who is a person I was fascinated to learn more about uh, in the course of writing this. Um, sort of the opponent of the women I'm writing about through much of their careers. Nevertheless, um, he's a figure of sympathy for me and of admiration. Uh, his thought was, well, okay, it is finally about just things we choose to promote, things we feel like uh, standing for, uh, but we can develop a logic of the things we promote or the things that we stand for, uh, that when we claim that something's right or wrong, we're not getting in touch with anything about the world. It's all unreal in some sense, but if we use certain words, certain concepts, they can have the implication that we're saying, let's 
me always choose consistently with what I've just said and let me, so far as is in my power, make the world the kind of place where these principles are accepted and followed. And so that's a more sophisticated, uh, more defensible, uh, more challenging version of the views that Ayer uh, had put forward. Thank you. We've got a question from Debbie Parker Kinch, who asks, um, who, who says, I'm interested in the usefulness of biography in understanding writers' creative or intellectual work. Could Professor Lipscomb comment on his reasons for choosing this approach to his subjects and what he feels is revealed by his approach, which might otherwise be overlooked? Hmm. Well, let me first be biographical about myself, that I was just fascinated with their story once I realized that a story was there and I thought someone needs to do this and it could actually even fall to me as someone with fairly significant teaching responsibilities at a small liberal arts college um, that a typical historian of this period might not know enough philosophy or be interested enough in the philosophy to tie the two together and I happen to be at a place where tenure is easy, where I have to show that I'm engaged with some ongoing project, but I don't have to hit some high number of publications in order to be continued. I could plug away for years at a project like this that's not oriented toward honing the cutting edge of some discussion in the journals. And that was a privilege uh, for me. So it was, this must be done. And maybe I happen to be in a position to do this where others might not pick it up. Um, I have thought about this uh, a lot. I'm grateful for the question. I feel like I understand their writings now. I had been a reader of their work for years before I realized how connected they were and thought, oh, this story. Uh, and I thought immediately, the story can be about friendship and ideas both because they are related, but I feel like I see into what they were doing better by having done this. Let me talk about Anscombe uh, because she doesn't come up in the passages that I read. That I was rereading her uh, slim little monograph intention earlier this fall with a student, actually my research assistant, who had gotten so interested in Anscombe in the course of reading over my materials that she wanted to read something by her a book she never would have picked up otherwise. But going back through it this time, I felt like I was seeing what she feared and what she wanted to see in the world in what could seem like a kind of a potentially incisive but dry discussion of under what conditions do we ascribe intention to someone. But really what is driving this for her is her being appalled at the justifications that her colleagues at Oxford gave for supporting Harry Truman's honorary degree in 1956. How could these people not see that in signing that order, even if he didn't drop the bomb, that, and even if he had thoughts about I'm saving lives, how could people not see that the means you choose to your end, the means of vaporizing thousands and thousands of people, are within your intention? And so she sets about to write a book to make this inescapably clear, to do the best philosophy she can, so as to make it that nobody could responsibly defend a view like that who had encountered her work. And I saw things like this right and left over the course of working on each of these four figures. And we've got a question from um, an anonymous attendee who says, thank you for such a wonderful session. Drawing parallels to India, the college that I graduated from, Interprasha Inter College for for women, University of Delhi, an 100 year old institution, um, which has a significant role to play in the national movement in India. But documentation for this, this college as compared to the men's colleges has been completely absent. What do you think of the consequences of this sort of erasure of the, of the contribution of women in history? Hmm. Okay, I, I'm, I'm glad for that 
uh, Volt at the end of the question because I was thinking, oh, I'm going to want to know so much more. I do, um, but I can speak to the question without asking, talk more about what the lack of documentation is like here. Um, erasure is a problem. Was it a problem in the case of these women? I'll say what I think was the biggest problem for certainly Murdoch and Midgley. Um, there were issues of social acceptance uh, for all of them. Um, the towering figure in the 1950s in Oxford was J.L. Austin, who ran this Saturday morning group for his male junior colleagues that was known uh, as Austin's kindergarten or Austin's playgroup. But it was, you know, one of the most distinguished professors at the university working on problems every week with up and coming colleagues. And uh, women were mostly not invited uh, to this. There's some contrary evidence whether they ever were invited to this. So there's that sort of thing. Um, and not seeing how uh, childbearing uh, burdens uh, women in the context of academic careers, not making allowances for that. But I think the biggest obstacle to them going forward was that what they wanted to do in philosophy was because of the specific theses they were defending, and sometimes because of the way that they were approaching them, trying to integrate bodies of thought that weren't narrowly within uh, the discipline as accepted and promoted, that this made their work harder to appreciate for their colleagues. That Isaiah Berlin, who had these worries about himself even, makes this dismissive remark about Iris Murdoch as a lady not known for the clarity of her views. Well, what she's doing is as a person who has read French and German and Russian thinkers and is trying to see what is going on with our whole late modern moment in the West in terms of our approach to ethics, an absolutely indispensable service, she's not doing the very fine-grained linguistic analysis that uh, her peers at the time are doing, and she judges that she's not a real philosopher for that reason. So that danger of not appreciating the many forms that good work can take. My questioner would have to consider whether anything like this happens in terms of the kind of work that went on at these different colleges at the University of Delhi, uh, the kind of work that the faculty there were particularly pursuing. Um, were the women faculty doing really excellent stuff that didn't register for the men as important? I don't know. And this this um, is paralleled today by um, people sometimes being told in philosophy that the work that they're doing is not philosophy, um, when it might just be that it's outside the traditional topics in philosophy or be doing it in a slightly different way. There is um, uh, another question um, from Leslie Jameson. In the course of studying the quartet, we encounter other forgotten figures from these periods are interesting in their own right. Does reading Donald McKinnon's work shed new light on the quartet's views, or is his role in their philosophical formation just one of ethos and welcoming out of fashion topics? It's a good question. Um, goodness, uh, there's a uh, graduate student, is he still a graduate student or is he finished now? I don't know, Andrew Mueller uh, uh, at the University of Otwego, I think. Um, who has a dissertation on McKinnon, and I, I hope that he works it up into a book. There should be a biography standalone of this man. Um, there are substantive borrowings. Uh, it's hard to know how much detail to go into here, but McKinnon was particularly interested in, for instance, Bishop Joseph Butler, 18th century um, philosopher, who in the face of cynical, overly monolithic interpretations of human action and motivation, like those of Thomas Hobbes and his followers, Butler, he's got this sort of slogan that associated with him, everything is what it is and not another thing. Um, 
that Butler wants to say, we have this huge assortment of motives. There's all kinds of generous and acquisitive and conflicted motives that make up uh, a complete picture of human psychology, and we can't lop off any of them. Um, this is Butler. This is what McKinnon saw in Butler, and this is pretty close to the heart. I'll put it this way. It's the germ of Mary Midgley's mature views as articulated at great length in her first book, Beast and Man. Uh, she took what McKinnon had said to her about Butler and thought, that's right. And so what I need to do is read Jane Goodall and Conra Conrad Lorenz and Nicholas Tinberg and, and get a really generous multi-sided view of human motivation and then put that together with the work in more narrowly philosophical ethics that people like my friend Philip Foote are doing. Okay, I think um, we're out of time. Um, Benjamin, thank you very much for your answers to those questions. Um, and uh, I would also like to say thank you to the audience that asked uh, those questions. I thought they were really excellent questions. Um, so thank you for that.